Welcome to Getaways, the show that goes where you want us to go. We're in the Czech Republic. Yes, we are in the capital city, Prague, and it is one of Europe's favorite city breaks, and you can see why at a quick glance, it is impressive. Now, many of you tend not to leave Prague when you come to the Czech Republic, but we are traveling east to the country's second city, Brno. So, shall we go check things out? Check, check, check it out. I get it, it's check, terrible. Check it out. We're in the Czech Republic. Coming up, Ginger, Fred, and a dancing building. And a twirl. <laughs> A classic way to see the city. I cannot stop singing one song. It's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You've <laughs> been like, singing it a stop. lot. And in this week's short getaway, Christian Nairn is taking giant footsteps at Hillsborough Castle in County Down. There are regular flights to Prague from Scotland, and the flight time is around two and a half hours. What do you know about Prague? Do you know what? I've actually been here before. Have you? Yeah, I came on a school trip when I was about 15 years old. <laughs> Pretty much forgotten it all. You've remembered absolutely nothing. <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you, when I think about Prague, I associate it with stag and hen -dos, and it has actually put me off a little bit coming here for a holiday, but quite a lot of people have got in touch with the recommendation, so it's clear that there's a lot more to Prague than stags and hens. We'll see. OK, JJ, you've brought us to a very specific place at a very specific time for a very good reason. You remember this? Yeah, I do remember this. And we've had loads of your recommendations as well, including Laura McCauley from Edinburgh, who said you've got to come and see the astronomical clock. It goes off every hour and it gives you quite a show. On the hour throughout the day, tourists crowd here to watch this medieval clock and its mechanical procession of the Twelve Apostles. I remember it like a big cuckoo clock. It was a bit more <laughs> eerie than that, actually. You found it eerie. Do you know what? I, you didn't tell me what was going to happen there, so I really didn't know what to expect. But what was amazing is how quiet the crowd went just as it started. In this busy world, it was something just very, very sweet and very simple. We visited Prague in September. Angela Roberts of Bangor told us midweek was best if you want to avoid the worst of the crowds. Prague is nicknamed the City of a Hundred Spires. In fact, it has nearly a thousand spires and towers. This is Prague's medieval powder tower. It's one of 13 original gates through the city wall, but this was Prague's front door because it was built to be decorative, not defensive. Having said that, they did store plenty of gunpowder here, hence the name. And if you're feeling fit, you can climb the 186 steps all the way to the top. I'll probably give that a miss. Thanks, JJ. This is one of the busiest tourist spots in all of Prague. When you tell people you're coming here, this is what they think of. Charles Bridge. It connects the old time with the new time. But being Prague, the new time is still over 500 years old. I'll give you one piece of advice, though. If you don't like crowds, come here quite early in the morning. It can get very, very busy, so you might find yourself lost in the crowds. Funny having walked along Charles Bridge just right in front of us here and how busy that is. Being down here seems so quiet in comparison. It's very surreal, actually. Mm. This is on. very relaxing. That was one thing that so many people got in touch about was taking a trip on a river boat. You know, a lot of people actually said it was a lot better to do the smaller river boats instead of some of those big tour boats. Uh, one of them being Rebecca Armstrong from Belfast, she said that. And Charlene Robinson said it as well, but that is the thing, there's so many different vessels to be had. You basically have your lunch on one of these ferry-sized things, or you can even get on a pedalo. Well, funny, Brian Whitney got in touch. He was one of them who said, don't bother with the river boats, take a pedalo instead. I don't think this is quite the place for a pedalo, if I'm no, honest. I'm quite enjoying this, actually. Maybe next time. That looks like fun. How are you? Very good, thank you. <laughs> that pedal is looking all right now, actually. <laughs> thank you very much. That was lovely. Thank, thank you. you. So Goodbye. Much. Oh, I like that. 
So this is Prague Castle, and it's actually the largest medieval castle in Europe, but it's perhaps not a castle in the traditional sense. Put it this way, if I went and asked my daughter to draw a castle, it wouldn't come out looking like this. It's actually made up of buildings, fortifications, cathedrals, and it overlooks the whole of Prague. You get a great view, and it's very important as well. The president still rules from here. Yeah, and I can see his flag is up, so he's in. And we timed our visit to catch a bit of a spectacle, the changing of the guard, which happens at noon. I am loving those shades. The changing of the guard takes place every day, all year round. It involves a fanfare or two, a banner exchange, and they secretly swap sunnies. I'm not joking, they really do. I think you enjoyed that. I absolutely loved that. Yeah, that was really cool. I felt myself at times standing to attention and I wasn't quite sure. I know! <laughs> There can be long queues to get into the castle, so take our advice, book well ahead. Uh, some good news, though, the public courtyards and gardens are free to visit. In the castle complex, you'll find another of Prague's most impressive buildings. It took over 600 years to build because they keep adding on towers and chapels. It is an incredible piece of architecture. The cathedral is where monarchs were crowned. It's the burial place of their patron saint, St. Wenceslas. Yes, that's the good King Wenceslas from the Carol. And if you want to stay close to Pride Castle, we've come across a rather unique option. This is a little bit different. It's not quite the same as those uh, more commercial hotels that you find over in the new time. Aha! Well, well, well. No, really, we've, we've actually got a well in here. I've never seen that before. It doesn't actually feel like a hotel. It feels more like a retreat. And the price for a super luxury suite just like this one is from £158 to £230 per room per night, depending on the time of year. Oh, and you get your own conservatory. Looking out into the courtyard. The city is easy to get around, and top tip, Tram 22 takes the best route around the main attractions. But we've decided to travel in style. Do you know, I wouldn't have thought to do something like this, but we had a recommendation from Nicola Corrigan from Crawfordsburn, and she said the little red cars give you a really, really good way to get about time. We opted for a tour lasting an hour, which took us through both the old and new town areas. It's quite expensive, it's you know. It's not cheap, is it? Well, we're talking about 70 to 80 pounds. But I suppose you can get four of you in the vehicle, so if you split that up, 20 pounds each, but it does feel more of a, a romantic thing, you know? Like, I feel like we look a bit silly. <laughs> I know. I don't know about you, but I cannot stop singing one song. It's Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. You, you've <laughs> like, been singing it a lot. the entire time. <laughs> Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Bang. Come on. Hi ho, Chitty Chitty Bang you Bang. You know the words, do you? I don't. <laughs> You love musical theatre. Chitty Chitty Bang Bang loves us too. That's it. That's it. <laughs> we'll be returning to the Czech Republic a little later, but now it's time for our short getaway, a break closer to home. This week, Christian Nairn, best known as Hodor from Game of Thrones, is making a royal visit to Hillsborough Castle in County Down. So, I'm a local lad. I grew up not a stone's throw away from here. And unfortunately, this is not my house. This is Hillsborough Castle. It is the Queen's residence when she is in Northern Ireland. And we are going to have a look around it today, so let's go. Now, it's probably worth mentioning that Hillsborough is not technically a castle. It's a Georgian mansion. So really, it's a big house. The castle's undergone a five-year, 20 million pound royal makeover as well as being the official residence of the Queen. It hosts visiting dignitaries and politicians and is home to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. And there's one room that immediately caught my attention. This is the throne room, um, but to dispel a myth, these are not thrones. These are chairs of state, so they represent the monarchy in absence. So whenever Her Majesty the Queen isn't here at Hillsborough Castle, these are our, our representation of her here at the castle. I notice they're not made from iron. <laughs> no, this is no Game of Thrones. So what is this um, room used for? 
So this is the ceremonial heart of Hillsborough Castle, uh, created by the Hill family in the 1840s to be their ballroom. So you can just imagine it filled with ladies in huge gowns and uh, twinkling candlelight. Uh, there was a real sort of feeling of glamour and opulence to it. And I, do, I think that you can really still feel the atmosphere here in Hillsborough Castle. The story that most visitors are interested in is the royal family. And some parts of the castle really do feel like their family home. So this is a very grand room. Um, what's the, what's it used for? So this is the state, state drawing room. Um, this really is the, the hub of relaxation in Hillsborough Castle. Sometimes they'll host lovely little intimate meetings here, but for the most part, this is a private room and mm. they'll come and they'll relax in the evenings here. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, I've, I've driven past this place, it must be 500 times in my life. It's really very different to what I expected. Oh, and, and everybody finds that, I think, what sets Hillsborough Castle apart from other big, grand, stately houses is that it really is a home. And like most family homes, Hillsborough has a back garden. But this is no ordinary family. And I'm getting the lowdown from their gardens manager, Claire Woods. What are the highlights for you? It's difficult to know where to start because we have 98 acres. Oh. And, uh, but one of the key ones really must be Lady Alice's temple and yew tree walk leading down to it. It's a lovely formal view and vista. So uh, Prince Charles has a reputation for being um, into architecture and also into horticulture and gardening. So has he ever grabbed the trial and done some digging? Well, we, we, we don't get them out with the team to dig, but <laughs> like so many of our royal visitors, we ask them to plant a ceremonial tree when they're here. Very good. Uh, so when you walk around the grounds, you'll actually find plaques, and there's over 200 of them commemorating different royal visits over the years. Can I have a tree? <laughs> that means no. <laughs> the castle is open daily, all year round, as long as the royals haven't popped in. Entry to the castle is by guided tour only. If you're planning a stay in Hillsborough, there are some accommodation options in the village, but just outside, Mill Farm cottages are fully equipped for self-catering. Or they have an on-site deli, if you prefer somebody else to do the cooking. Welcome back to the Czech Republic, and our next stop is Berno, 128 miles southeast of Prague. Well, it's fair to say that most of you probably haven't heard of this destination. It's the second city of the Czech Republic, Brno. And if you're trying to escape the crowds, this is the place for you. But having said that, it is popular with the people of Prague themselves. It's only about two and a half, three hours to get here. And you can come by train or car or bus. Although we came here by car and I would definitely recommend getting the train. It's quite a trek, isn't it? Yeah, fair enough. Our first stop, the Daily Fruit and Veg Market in the city centre. For another famous clock. Yes, this is a clock. No one actually knows how it works. That's the fascinating thing about it. But you'll notice there's a lot of people standing around it and they're all hoping to catch a marble which drops from it at exactly 11 o'clock. Shall we do it? Definitely. Let's go find our marble. <laughs> you got your arm inside? No, not quite. There's only one armhole in each section. So when if it's already taken, you, you haven't got a chance. JJ's got lucky. He's made some friends here and he's managed to get his arm in. I'm gonna leave him to it. One minute. Really nervous. It's kind of like a squeaking noise as it turns. It's really <laughs> ominous. Come on. Oh, no, 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 Do it. No, no. Can you hear it? No, no luck this, this time. This is an expert. Not for the first time, I can see. I've lost my marbles. Well, Barno is definitely an unusual destination, and here's one of its unusual attractions. All cities have their legend, and Barno is no different. Theirs is about a dragon that used to roam the land, wreaking havoc, until one day a butcher travelling through the city decided to take matters into his own hands. He killed the dragon, and to celebrate, the residents had him hung up here and preserved. Uh, but is it just me, or does he look 
more like a crocodile. Well, it's clear there is a ton of history above ground in Brno, but you know what? There's a lot underground as well. Now I'm going to show you something that's a bit different. It's not for the faint-hearted. Come and have a look. Well, this is the ossuary of St. James, and what is an ossuary? Well, as you can see, it's a place where they store bones, and in fact, this is the second largest in Europe, with over 50,000 skeletons stored here. These skeletons, dating back to the 1600s, were placed under a church to create room in the surrounding graveyards and then forgotten about for centuries. They were only rediscovered in 2001 during renovation works. Forensic archaeologists have studied the bones and can identify who died of diseases such as cholera and the plague. Well, it is a remarkable thing to see. Clearly, it's not for everybody. I think my mum would find it a bit eerie. I don't know if I would bring the kids. But it is an amazing way to see the history of Brno. Now, we do like to bring you some hidden gems on this programme, and this is certainly one of them. It's hard to imagine behind this, well, rather ugly fence is one of the country's most beautiful buildings. This is the Villa Tugendhat, which was designed by the world-acclaimed architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe in the early 20th century. The family that built this house only actually got to live here for a total of eight years. They were forced to leave the country when the Nazis invaded, but since then it's gone from being a family home to being a stables, a dance school, and now it's one of the country's most popular tourist destinations. It's considered a monument of modern architecture and it's a magnet to anybody with an interest in design. The interiors have been fitted out with exact replicas of the original furniture, and 90 years on, it's lost none of its edge. It's hard to believe that this place was designed in the 1920s. It's so modern, the attention to detail, it's just so exquisite. And despite all that, one thing that's hard to beat is that view. But the bad news is you have to plan ahead. There's a three-month waiting list for tours of the villa and its gardens. This place has real historical significance as well. It was in these gardens that the discussions took place regarding the separation of Czechoslovakia, when the Czech Republic and Slovakia came to be independent nations, often known as the Velvet Divorce. Meanwhile, I'm on the other side of town, where I've discovered a pretty unique place to stay. Yes, this is Tenzi Nuclear Bunker. It's built deep under the city's castle and was once a top secret civil defence shelter. In the communist era, it was highly classified and designed to protect politicians and bureaucrats. It's now a museum and hostel. I rendezvoused with Dr. Pavel Palacek, the modern day mastermind behind the operation here. Oh, this is brilliant. So this is one of 13 bedrooms uh, available uh, for backpackers to stay overnight in our Cold War Museum. Wow, so mainly backpackers, who else stays? People who look for adventure. Really, and how long do they come and stay for? Uh, well, usually we recommend to stay one night. Just one yes, night? Because it's very cold here. It's 18 degrees of Celsius and uh, as any other shelter, there are no windows. This is no longer an active bunker, is it? Well, it is active bunker. It's a, a part of the emergency system of the whole region. If uh, any emergency occurs, then we pass the keys from the bunker to the regional government. And from that time, if any chemical disaster or atom bomb happens, we guarantee that any time the bunker can be used in a case of war. Wow. A room for two people for one night, and remember, that's all they recommend, will cost you around £43. 
Listen, that was seriously cool. I reckon I would stay there, but I know Holly wouldn't. Maybe if it was an emergency. Maybe. The bunker is built deep underneath the medieval Spielberg Castle, which dominates the city skyline. Over the centuries, it's been a royal residence for the rulers of this region, Moravia. It was once a notorious prison, a barracks, and nowadays it's home to the City Museum. And of course, it gives an excellent bird's eye view over the town. But if nuclear bunkers aren't your thing and you're looking for somewhere much more conventional, the Hotel International Berno has luxuries like heating and windows. And you can stay here for more than one night. It will set you back from £72 to around £85 for a double room per night for two people sharing. So, Berno, what do you make of the Czech second city? There's something about it has a real sort of fairy tale vibe to it. Do you know what I mean? It felt like it was something out of Grimm's fairy tale. Every building, every statue felt like there was some sort of little story or legend behind it. It's pretty unique. <laughs> There's some pretty sort of eerie and different things to experience, I would say. But actually, I think the thing I liked most about it was it wasn't too big, pretty much walk everywhere, mm. but also it wasn't too busy. Because a lot of the tourists, obviously, in the Czech Republic end up in Prague. But it is a shame. It's two and a half hours from Prague, so how would you score it out of five? I'm going to give it a three. A three? I think I'll give it a three and a half. I don't know if I'd come back, but I might recommend it. At least we know where the skeletons are buried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Back to Prague, and we've left the city centre to see what's on offer in the outskirts. This is a place that a lot of tourists actually miss out on, Vidkov Hill. It doesn't make many top ten lists for tourists, but there's a very good reason it's so popular with local residents. It's got its own national monument, it's got a cracking view, and it's home to one of the biggest bronze equestrian statues in the whole world. Just behind me here is the tallest building in Prague. It's the Zhishkov TV Tower. Now, you might have noticed it's not exactly the most attractive building here, is it? In fact, at one point, it was voted the second ugliest building in the whole world. And then to add its problems, the more eagle-eyed of you may have noticed some babies crawling up the side of it. Now, this is supposed to be protest art against the communist era, but uh, to me, it's just a little bit creepy. It's one of those TV towers that were once so popular in communist states, especially when the space race was raging between the East and the West. Well, I wanted to see inside and outside. Look at that view. As well as the observation deck, there's a restaurant and a bar and a relaxation area. I do feel a little bit like a Christmas tree decoration. Now, don't tell us we don't find you different places to stay. The TV Tower has its very own hotel, but this hotel has just one room. Yes, one room, but what a room. You need to see this view. Wow. The one-room hotel costs from around £428 for a weeknight stay. Weekends are slightly more expensive at around £471. When you come to Prague, you might not imagine that you would see something like this. Open eight days a week, it's a constantly evolving homage to John Lennon and the Beatles. And in fact, fans from across the world come together to pay their respects as a sort of little mecca. And despite repeated attempts to clean it up over the years, they've now decided to let it be. is the Czech Republic's largest contemporary art centre. Now, I know what you're all thinking, that this is just another art gallery. But actually, this one will even keep the kids entertained. For example, just at the moment, the exhibition focuses on one of the world's most successful children's illustrators. And the whole idea behind the exhibition is about dreams and flying. This, surely, though, is the centre's pièce de résistance. This huge wooden structure has been inspired by early 20th century airships. It's called Gulliver. It's now used as a reading room where people can come together and let their imaginations soar. It really is an amazing space. It actually takes a few minutes for your eyes to adjust to the design. It's 
a remarkable bit of architecture. I mean, you could just imagine being a small child coming in here and feeling like you're in a real life spaceship called Gulliver, kind of living up to that idea of exploration and just letting your imagination run away with itself. So, Holly, are you dancing? JJ, are you asking? So is my arm the balcony? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you're the tall building on the right. So let me introduce you to Fred and Ginger, recreated beautifully by us. This is known as the dancing building. Can you, do you get it? I mean, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. I'm starting to see it better and better. My hair's not that scruffy, though. I don't know. I think it's got a little bit of similarity going bit. on there. But I think it's, it's a beautiful bit of architecture, and you compare that to some of the older buildings yeah. around here. It's Someone was making right. a statement when they put that up. It certainly has. One, two, and, uh, and a twirl. <laughs> Should we just leave the dance into the building? Yeah. Fred and Ginger, better. you've got this. <laughs> The good citizens of Prague are also passionate about puppets. The city has puppet shops, puppet makers, and even a puppet museum. And tonight we're getting a little bit of culture. It is Don Giovanni. Oh, no, it isn't. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> the Czech love affair with puppets probably dates back to the 12th century, when the figures were used as entertainment at royal feasts and ceremonies. That's the way to do it. I don't know about you, but I thought that was brilliant. It really goes with Prague, because mm. you can feel the history in it, you can feel the tradition in it. Yeah, I was really impressed. It's a really, really nice night out. Uh, but was it just me, or was some of the acting a little bit wooden? God. No? here expecting to see nothing but stags and hen -dos. and I'll be honest I didn't see a single one yeah it's an absolute feast for the eyes and you've got to look up statues everywhere unbelievable architecture and it really is one of those cities as good as the postcards really but tell me would you come back um, I would a romantic getaway with the wife would be lovely it is a very romantic place but uh, I think it's time for us to check out of Prague we... we'll, we'll see you next time on getaways yeah. <laughs>